still at home. Afterwards, we've got um, tea and coffee out the back. And, um, and at the end, open, your choice, no, no problem. And just breathe. Breathe in and breathe out. Just enjoy the sensation of breathing. Nothing more. No need to count the breath. Just let the air come in and out your nostrils. We take our first in breath at birth and our last out breath occurs at death. In between, we just breathe in and breathe out. Simple. Okay, open your eyes, keep breathing, it's useful, and now we'll just have a look at the, um, the book we're using for the, um, the outline of this um, intro series is The Essence of the Path to Enlightenment by our founder and spiritual head. Um, a root guru, Keshi Acharya Tudunodin here. Um, it's a beautiful little book, um, and as the title implies, it outlines it's the path to enlightenment. It is the essence of the path to enlightenment. So, just um, before we get into that, I'd just like to read the forward by. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. The Lamrim teachings are a uniquely Tibetan presentation of the Buddhist path. They originate from a small text by the Indian master Atisha who came to Tibet in the 11th century. He felt that Tibetans needed a concise explanation of the entire paths and stages to enlightenment. Subsequently, Tibetan masters of all traditions have given teachings 
following this pattern based on their own study and experience. The publication of a book of Lamrim teachings as explained by Sergei Geshe Acharya Tukhtun Lodum. He is part of the same legacy. This book will go a long way towards making the essential instructions of Tibetan Buddhism because in addition to his monastic training, Geshe-la has had long experience of teaching in the West and it's signed by His Holiness. So I just thought I'd give you that as a, a nice little um, overview of um, the path to enlightenment, the Lamrim teachings that um, are the basis of all the Tibetan um, teachings. So um, the chapters in the book, we'll go through those over the next four weeks. They are yeah, that one again. Guru, Life, Death, Refuge, Karma, Samsara, Nirvana, Bodhicitta, Meditation, Wisdom and Enlightenment. So over the four weeks we'll just explore and do little meditations, meditations on these topics and, and how they relate to our experience. Um, how we can integrate these into our daily lives just to make it all work. So, um, enlightenment is a state of mind. Um, there's not a lot that we have to change in our lives apart from our, our mind to become enlightened. So we don't have to go anywhere special, um, switch jobs, do anything out of the ordinary. It's just working with mind. And the, the name we chose for these talks and meditations is the joy of Dharma, because Dharma should be joyful. It's, um, it's the path to enlightenment. So it's the entire purpose of Dharma is to stop suffering. So um, we should be joyful. Um, so the purpose of Dharma is to create happiness, initially realizing that we should stop ourselves suffering and have happiness, and then realizing that everybody would like happiness. So then we work towards that goal, benefiting all sentient beings. Uh, as I said, Dharma is the path out of suffering. So uh, it could take a while, um, lifetimes possibly, but time is beginningless and endless. <laughs> so, um, and cyclic existence goes on forever. So if we actually get enlightened, we don't have to keep going around in the same um, experience of birth, ageing, sickness, death, over and over, life after life. Um, so even though it can take a while, it's certainly worth doing. So I'll give you a little background information, um, just putting the, the teachings and the um, path of enlightenment in perspective. The, um, so Lord Buddha is the founder of the Buddhist tradition. He was born about 2,600 years ago in uh, and lived in northern India um, and Nepal, lived his life around that area. He, um, he was a prince, um, yeah, royal. Um, so he had a very indulged um, lifestyle, um, all good conditions, lots of wealth, um, many enjoyments. And his parents didn't actually want him to, to see how life really was. So they kind of sheltered him and just um, 
is allowed to lead a really nice indulged life. But out of curiosity, he ventured out of the palace and he came across a... Um, initially, he saw a sick person and then he saw a, an old person and then he came across a dead person and um, totally freaked out because he hadn't experienced any of this um, real world in his palace existence. So he went to his, um, his dad, the king, and basically said, is this how things are? Like, does everybody um, get sick, old and die? And his father basically said, yes. So the prince, Prince Siddhartha, he left the palace and he began the life of a sadhu, a, um, like a wandering yogi. And he spent the next seven years um, in study, meditation, um, trying to find out if he could actually overcome this um, birth, sickness, aging and death. This is true cessation and this is true path. So this is what the Buddha said. Know the suffering, abandon the source, attain the cessation and meditate on the path. Know the suffering, then there is nothing more to know. Abandon the source, then there is nothing more to abandon. Attain the cessation, then there is nothing more to attain. And meditate on the path, then there is nothing more to meditate on. That's it. Simple. So that's the basis of Buddhist philosophy. They're called truths because that's the way things are. It's like universal truths. Um, there is suffering. Um, it has causes. Uh, there is the cessation of suffering and there is a path to that cessation of suffering. So what we do, we recognize and acknowledge that we are suffering, which often takes a while to really appreciate, then we, once we know we're suffering, we quickly find out what's causing it, and then we very quickly find a cure, an antidote, and then we apply that antidote. Um, so it's like when you're really sick, just in everyday life. If you're not feeling well and you visit your doctor, and you say, like, I'm in pain, I've got some problem, whatever it might be, then, so you go to someone that you you trust, a doctor that you can rely on. So that's what, like, basically the whole idea of this guru, teacher, reliable doctor getting you out of your suffering. And that's the first noble truth. So it's like, yes, doctor, I'm suffering, I'm in pain. So you acknowledge it and then you've got something to to work with and someone to work with. So you know you're suffering, you're experiencing pain, you want it to end, and so the doctor checks you out, tells you why you're suffering, what's probably causing the suffering, and that's the second noble truth, the cause or causes of your suffering. So just in everyday life, that's how we apply these noble truths. The, the causes of our suffering, there are lots. Um, they're just basically the, the sort of Buddhist outline initially is birth, sickness, aging and death. But then there are all the others of everything that we can relate to just um, meeting, um, meeting things that are unpleasant, um, the suffering when things that we enjoy, we're separated from those, so losing the pleasant things is suffering. Um, 
just anything, everything, like any suffering of mind or body. Um, there's so many sufferings. It's um, just all the things, not getting what we want, uncertainty, um, dissatisfaction, loneliness. Um, even right now, like while, while we're all sitting here and we think, um, you know, I'm comfortable at the moment and, you know, not too bad. And then you get tired in that position and the, so the, the suffering of change hits in and you think, oh, I need to, I need to move. I was comfortable, but now I'm not. So you're suffering. Or, or even in relation to like this talk, you think, oh, this could be interesting. And then you think, no, this seems really boring. I'm suffering. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, when will this be over? Why did I come here? Oh, I'm suffering. All these things. So suffering, we all have our own experience of suffering. Um, and so that's, yeah, suffering is serious. Um, it's everywhere. And that's the, um, that's the second noble truth, the causes of suffering. So they're pervasive, like one moment you're not suffering, the next you are, and you think, oh, this is really good, but that ends and then you're suffering again. The whole thing of Buddhism is not that we should be suffering. A lot of people just think Buddhism is suffering because, you know, Buddhists just talk about <laughs> suffering. But the idea is to get to the next noble, <laughs> noble truth when the doctor says, okay, no, here you go. Here's a prescription. This will cure your sickness. Or like here are tablets, take these. This will cure your sickness, all these things. Um, that's what the third noble truth is. There is a cessation of suffering. Um, there is a path to the cessation of suffering. So all the, the Buddhist teachings are the antidote to suffering. So it's just that tiny little bit at the beginning that is um, unpleasant, mm, acknowledging that we're suffering. And, and lots of people, Buddhists included, don't get past the first. So in Buddhism, the whole point of Buddhism is to cut through all the causes of suffering and experience bliss and to get enlightened so the the um the doctor the doctor says take this this will cure you don't we go yes please that's fantastic um that's the end of our suffering and that's so that then it's up to us right it's if we apply the medicine that our doctor gives us um, or whether we just go, I've got the medicine that will cure me, and then we put that in the drawer or on the bench or wherever, and then think, I'm not getting better. So even though we have faith in the doctor and in the medicine and all the wonderful science and technology, if we don't apply it, it doesn't work. So it's kind of just believing things um, doesn't make you better doesn't make you healthy so by the antidote to any mm, any sickness or suffering so th that then the the suffering will stop so that's what we're basically doing so on the everyday analogy the doctor says you're suffering this will fix it take this you'll get better you take the medicine you do get better and fantastic all good. So it's the same with practicing Dharma. You you know you're suffering. You wait a while until you go, yeah, I'm really suffering. Um, it wasn't so bad. I had all good conditions. Um, but now I'm suffering because of whatever reasons. There's plenty of reasons. And so you go to your, instead of going to your doctor, you go to somebody to find out how can I overcome all these Mm, obstacles to my life. So that's basically what the Dharma is. 
um, it's a path to enlightenment and enlightenment is the cessation of suffering so that's what we're doing um, yeah so the joy joy is not, is not in the suffering bring is not a in um in the buddhist teachings everything is impermanent um everything is dependent so things they change um so one moment we're not suffering then we're suffering for a little while then we're not so the idea and um go beyond suffering uh, Yeah, and everything is is perceived through our own mind. We are, we we experience so our sufferings and our happiness is from our own side. That's another. That's the mind. So we're dealing with ideas like I like this and I don't like that, or I I like her but I don't like him. All these things from our own side that don't apply to other people. So the whole. Mm, series of the teachings of the path to enlightenment put it all into a framework where you can um, you can work with um, a gradual cessation of suffering on the path to enlightenment and that's what all these little chapter outlines are so initially you you have your teacher your guru who's like Chakamuni Buddha so he's our guru as is uh, Lama Tsongkhapa who condensed all the the um, the texts in Tibet and went through all the uh, Buddha's sutras and the commentaries and condensed it into these succinct Tibetan this tradition and then and Geshe Geshe Acharya Thupten Lodin he's our guru because he's just following the same path so that's what we're we're doing they're like our our doctor and we we can get over all our suffering um, the nature of the mind is clarity and awareness so it's it's not there is nothing in in the mind that is intrinsically or permanently um, suffering so the, and the whole point of meditation is to settle that mind to see the clarity of mind and then to work in that clarity to bring about enlightenment so meditation is it requires the study first because you have to have to know what you're meditating on um, so you actually have to know how the mind functions um, and whether you're just asleep or mind just blank because um, we're using the mind to get to a point where we can have complete clarity and any negative states of mind that arise we can um, see them as they arise so we're not immediately um, just responding uh, immediately to them so our own reality is the creation of our mind um, yeah so sometimes our mind is just crazy um, ang like anger comes up greed um, just plain um, ignorant kind of mind just blank um, and we all have these states of mind they come up and that is a step by step ongoing daily practice over time um, it'll work the mind will settle we'll feel better um, all the mm, negative states or um, pride jealousy all these Settle. Um, so we kind of just 
work with those um, and step by step, it's kind of like, like I like to use the analogy of like compost. Um, you get all the this yucky stuff, you know, veggie scraps and, and manures, whatever, yucky things that you think oh, that's just, you just throw those out because that's how the negative, the negative states of mind are. But if you make compost out of those, then you end up with this fabulous sort of nourishment to feed your garden for your veggies or for um, your flowers or whatever. And in, in Buddhism, that's like the first um, part of Buddhism is renouncing suffering. And that the analogy of the idea of that is that out of this swamp of compost of negative states of mind, the in Indian tradition, the lotus comes up and arises out of that. And that's um, that sort of symbolizes renunciation. So you're renouncing all this swamp of yuckiness, but the, the lotus is this beautiful thing that arises from that. So, and the same here at the center, like with the roses or the salvias, all the, the compost and good things that are making the soil rich is kind of all the leftovers from everywhere. Um, so we're doing the same thing to use all our negative states of mind for renunciation. So then we can grow from all our suffering rather than just wondering how we how we deal with our suffering. So um, Yeah, so the first chapter, the first chapter is on the guru. So the guru is like a teacher, um, but it's teachers, it's a guru is more than a teacher, uh, like a guru is a spiritual guide. So, um, like nowadays, um, yeah, the word guru's got bad, like bad press, bad connotation. Um, all this stuff about sort of manipulation and abuse and all those things. And and those are things we certainly have to watch out for. Um, we need a, a reliable, honest, um, trustworthy guide. A guru, that's the whole point of it. Um, in um, Geshe's book here, he says that to, um, to traverse an unfamiliar path, we need directions of an experienced guide. To learn a new skill, we need a teacher. And to learn a new discipline, we must rely on a mentor. Similarly, to chart the mysteries of the inner path of spiritual and mental development, we need an experienced guru as guide. So that's basically the whole point. You need someone who is skilled and experienced. Um, and and I, so that's where, like for us, uh, Geshele is our guru. His books, are his, um, his teachings. So we can, it's like Chakamuni Buddha. He's our guru and Chakamuni Buddha was around two and a half thousand years ago. So the um, the practice of guru yoga is is really sort of the basis of the Tibetan tradition, which um, so it's yeah you really have to be skillful in in your acceptance of a guru. Um, yeah, there's a very interesting thing in Maitreya the future um, Buddha, uh, in, whenever he comes, uh, wrote in his ornament for Mahayana Sutras on the 10 qualities of the perfect guru. So it's basically, he says, it's from Maitreya, rely on a guru who is controlled, pacified, completely pacified, who has more knowledge than you, perseverance, 
a wealth of scriptural knowledge, realization of suchness, is skilled in teaching, has love and compassion, and has abandoned being discouraged from teaching. So just expanding on those. So rely on a guru who is controlled, so controlled by pure morality, so which is often missing in modern times. Pacified through meditation, so the guru's mind is settled. Completely pacified through meditating on discriminating wisdom, so knowing what to do and what not to do. Um, who has more knowledge than you, so that's pretty easy. Perseverance, to put up with us. Um, a wealth of scriptural knowledge, so who knows the Buddha's uh, teachings and texts. Uh, realizes, realization of suchness, so that is the, the experience, the wisdom of um, perceiving dependent arising and shunyata, which is like the emptiness of inherent existence. Um, yeah, which takes a lot of study and meditation to get there. Uh, is skilled in teaching, so it teaches us what we need at the appropriate time. Has love and compassion, which is wonderful and has abandoned being discouraged from teaching, so hasn't given up and just said, well, I'm going back to my cave or something, you can look after yourselves. Um, and then Maitreya also goes on to say, if you cannot find a teacher with the ten qualities, they should have at least five. So your teacher, your guru, should be controlled by ethics, pacified by med meditative concentration, so being able to meditate and settle the mind, completely pacified through discriminating wisdom, have that realisation of suchness, of the emptiness of inherent existence, and have love and compassion. And if that's not possible, things getting pretty dire, then at minimum the guru should have three. More qualities than false, more concern for others than himself or herself, and more interest in future lives than this life, so not out to become something just like really um, serious concern for enlightenment. Um, so yes, yeah, Shakyamuni Buddha is our guru. The teachings of uh, Buddha Dharma come from Shakyamuni Buddha. Lama Tsongkhapa, who um, is the founder and head of the uh, Garukpa tradition, the tradition that His Holiness is part of, and um, Geshe-la. Um, Lama Tsongkhapa lived in Tibet from 1357 to 1419, and he's the one who synthesized all the Buddha's teachings and the commentaries by all the um, Indian masters, and can put them into the um, original uh, Path of Enlightenment text. And then Geshe-la, who too is our, um, certainly geshe -la is our root guru. Then, so I'd like just to give you a little bit of, for this, um, understanding the guru. So Geshe-la, um, Geshe-la, geshe, -la, geshe took to Moden, our founder, um, spiritual guide of the Tibetan Buddhist society, responsible for all of this property and the temple and these books and all of this, and the students here. Uh, I guess it was born in 1924 in eastern Tibet and was ordained as a monk at the age of seven. And then he spent 35 years in study and meditation at uh, on all the Buddhist subjects, uh, most of that at Sarah, uh, Sarah J. Um, Monastic University in Lhasa. Um, so most of Geshe-la's training was done there at Sarah. And in 1959, Geshe-la left um, Tibet, along with many thousands of other Tibetans, including His Holiness, after the um, 
the communist invasion. And Gessler continued his studies in India um, and was awarded the um, highest university degree in the Tibetan tradition, Geshe Larampa. A Geshe degree is like a, um, a doctorate in divinity and meditation study. And there are certain um, grades of that, and the Larampa is the highest uh, Geshe degree. So Geshe received that from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He also received an Acharya degree with honours from the Sanskrit University uh, in uh, Varanasi in India. And he received a degree in Tantric studies from the Jume Tantric College. And so in, and that was all in Tibet and then India. And then in 1976, uh, Lama Tukhtin uh, invited Geshe to teach at Chinraizi Institute up in in um, Yudlo, sort of the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast up in Queensland, and a beautiful little um, meditation centre up there. Geshe taught there for three years, and that was his like, contract to be there, um, and got many, many students there, myself included. And then after his contract expired, um, Geshe returned to India and um, he was back there for a short time and then after speaking and getting the blessings from His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Geshe's uh, root guru, uh, His Eminence Tree Jane Rinpoche, uh, Geshe returned to Australia and um, step by step made this here his uh, permanent residence uh, principal base of residence and established the Tibetan Buddhist Society which has centres in um, here in Melbourne and Sydney and Perth and Brisbane um, and this property here we bought this in 1988 the this temple was built in uh, the year 2000 and blessed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 2002. Uh, and then Geshe yeah, he passed away in 2011, August 2011. Um, but his, his legacy, the, his nine books, so he's got three Path to Enlightenment books, The Essence, The Meditations, and The Big Path to Enlightenment, A Fundamental Potential, for Enlightenment book and some Vajrayana commentaries. Um, so those are his legacy as well as his centres and his students. So Geshe is our guru and in, in the Path to Enlightenment books um, Geshe explains how from our side we should relate to the guru, um, which is, so we know uh, what type of um, qualities or attributes we require in a guru, but then a guru requires um, something from us as well. Um, so those, um, the requirements, Geshe explains, are the student needs to be honest. So our relationship with the guru from our side should be honest. Um, we should use wisdom. So we need to actually think about what the guru is telling us and we need to discriminate between what's correct and what's not. Uh, in the Vinaya Sutra, so from Lord Buddha, um, if the instructions are leading in the wrong direction, it says, if it does not conform with the Dharma, do the opposite. So if your guru asks you to do something that is not appropriate in, in Dharma practice, then do the opposite, so don't do it. Um, so we need to know these things. We're not just a um, sort of blind faith. We don't want that. Then we also require a genuine aspiration to learn. So we need to make effort from our own side. So it's not just the guru pushing us, we actually have to 
um, do the work ourselves. We need to be respectful of both the teacher and the teachings. And we need to listen with um, concentration and mindfulness. And Shakyamuni Buddha um, in the sutra said, um, listen well, listen fully and retain in the mind. Um, which often is easier said than done. We actually need to listen and then we really need to listen to what is said and then retain that um, rather than just forgetting what we're actually told. So um, rather than me just sort of talking, 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 I'd like to, to do just a little meditation now on a... Um, what are called the four immeasurable. Um, it's a nice basic Buddhist uh, meditation on um, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So just um, just relax yourself for meditative kind of space. Um, so just relax, sit comfortably. And if you're on the chair, just as comfortably as you can. It's not always comfortable in the chair. Uh, rest your hands in front of you in the lap if you like, or on your knees, your choice. Uh, right hand on your left palm, your thumbs touching if you put your hands in front. And then just relax. Relax the whole body. Have your head slightly tilting forward, spine very straight, head just chin just slightly in so that you're not too far forward when you go to sleep and not leaning anywhere too far back or get agitated. Just relaxing. So relax the, uh, the head, the mouth, the jaw, all of that. And you can close your eyes if you want. Have them open or in between. Whatever feels comfortable to you. Just relax your shoulders, neck and arms. And breathe. Or breathing. Breathe in. And breathe out at your own pace. Just gently breathing. Just relax the breath. We get to the meditation in the four immeasurable moment. Just put on the breathing. It's good at the beginning of any any meditation practice just to calm the breath first. Just observe the inhalation and exhalation of the breath. So now we generate a, um, a useful motivation for the meditation, positive kind of positive aspiration or intention. So we're not here like in ten you know, motivation to oh I'd like to have, be a millionaire or I'd like to be a celebrity. It's a weird thing. We just meditate to benefit benefit sending beings. So the initial motivation, the thought, is to completely, permanently eliminate 
suffering, their own suffering. So it's like when you're following the Four Noble Truths. So our wish is to permanently, completely, entirely eliminate our suffering and all the causes of suffering. All All the mental suffering, physical suffering, we want them gone. The wish to attain liberation, the indestructible inner peace of nirvana. So that's what we want. That would be nice. Greater than that meditation, that thought, is the wish for all sentient beings, humans, all humans, and all non-humans, everyone, to be free from suffering and all causes of suffering. the wish to attain enlightenment to benefit all these sentient beings. Just relax with that thought. So this is the, um, this thought, this motivation called the mm, conventional mind of enlightenment, this motivation to benefit oneself and others. Maitreya explained to find bodhicitta as, he said, bodhicitta means for the sake of others wishing to attain complete, perfect enlightenment. So for the sake of others means all others. Friends, enemies, strangers, all beings, animals, whatever other realms of being, for the sake of all others wishing to attain complete, perfect enlightenment. So just relax, enjoy your breathing, calm flow of the breath, and we'll meditate now on the four immeasurables love compassion joy and equanimity so firstly great love How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and all the causes of happiness. So let your let your mind, let your heart open to that thought. 
Imagine that. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and all the causes of happiness. Now think, may they have happiness and all the causes of happiness. I will help them to have happiness and the causes of happiness. Bless me to bring this about in this way. So now, just visualize in your mind, imagine gentle rain of blessings coming down, falling through space. Coming down gently, slowly, like rose petals falling from the sky. the nature of life. So let all your senses take in the blessing. Make this more than just an intellectual exercise. Breathe in the blessing. Beautiful fragrant rose petals. Feel on your skin the gentle touch of light nature, petals falling. Listen to the sound, the quiet, almost inaudible sound of petals, of blessing, like leaves that fall in autumn, just gently coming down. Filling your body and mind. Blessings from Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, holy beings, if you're not familiar with Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, just imagine blessings from God or Jesus. No problem. Main, the main issue in our meditation here, just that wish. For all sentient beings to have happiness and all the causes of happiness. feel that these blessings purify and invigorate our mind. Give us the energy, the enthusiasm, the inspiring strength. Just believe we can do this very beneficial mind training meditation. Can you continue just gently breathing, feeling the blessing? Filling your body and mind The joyful intention, the wish to bring about happiness for all beings.
beautiful, bright nature blessing us. Totally filling our body and mind with bliss. And now feel of the vast, amazing, beautiful mind of great love. Wishing all beings to have happiness. Now we meditate on compassion, great compassion. Thinking how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were free from suffering and all the causes of suffering. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I will help them to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Bless me to bring this about in this way. So now, once again, visualize, imagine beautiful, gentle rain of blessing falling like rose petals, gently coming down in nature of light, completely filling your body and mind with bliss. Just imagine that. Now feel you have received the mind of great compassion. The wish for all beings to be free from suffering and all the causes of suffering. And now we meditate on joy. How wonderful it would be if all city of beings were never separated from the happiness which is without suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness which is without suffering. I will help them to never be separated from the happiness which is without suffering. Bless me to bring this about in this way. So once again, visualize, imagine Beautiful, gentle rain of blessing falling through space, and all your senses taking in the experience. Slowly coming down, filling the entire body and mind with the experience of bliss. Feel you have received the mind of immeasurable joy. And finally, 
We meditate on the fourth noble truth, fourth measurable, equanimity. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings could abide in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and aversion, free from holding some close and others distant. This means seeing all beings equally, not as friends, enemies and strangers. Think, may they abide in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. I will help them to abide in equanimity. Bless me to bring this about in this way. Once again, beautiful, gentle rain of blessings descend. Gently, slowly, delicate like rose petals, falling like autumn leaves, fragrant, almost silent, Lightly touching your skin and the nature of light. Filling your body and mind with bliss. Feel you've received the realization equanimity. Then, with great love and compassion, Wishing all beings, oneself and others, to have happiness, to be free from suffering, to experience happiness, which is without suffering, and to abide in equanimity beyond the thoughts of friends, enemies, and strangers. Set your mind on the intention to study and meditate all the stages of the path to enlightenment. Gradually making time to meditate A little bit to begin with, then more as we get into it. The entire path from Guru Yoga through all the stages to benefit all sentient beings. So then we dedicate the merit, this positive energy, to 
the attainment of complete, perfect enlightenment in order to benefit all human beings. And by dedicating this merit, our good intentions, our actions, not wasted, the merit lasts, and our minds continue on <coughs> until we attain enlightenment. We dedicate by thinking. <clears throat> by this virtue, may all beings complete the collections of wisdom and merit and attain the two holy bodies arisen from wisdom and merit. And then May the precious, superior mind of enlightenment <coughs> be generated in those who have not yet generated it and not decrease in those who have developed it. But increase continuously. Okay, I think that'll do for now. Um, anybody have any questions? Why have my legs gone to sleep or something like that? Any questions? Hello. Yes. Yes, I think it must be. Um, oh, yes. The question is um, with the the ten. <coughs> excuse me. The ten. This online as well. Um, with the ten qualities of the perfect guru, if you can't get the ten, then there are five. And if they're the hard to find the five, and things are really degenerate, then you go for the three. I'm not sure if it'll go less than that. Hopefully not. Um, but yeah, the last three doesn't mention realization of suchness of emptiness. Um, yeah, so it's just um, basically knowing more than we know about Dharma and con more concern about us than themselves, um, and then more concern about future lives. So it's not a um, a worldly thing. I think fortunately nowadays like there are still lots of gurus with the ten qualities like his holiness and lots of the geshis and and geshi geshi and geshi mars and so men women them they everybody has the potential to have all ten qualities so there's no um um it's not that degenerate a time yet <laughs> but if you can't get can't find the ten qualities, then um, try for the five. If things are really desperate, go for three. And um, 
Yeah, good luck after that. <laughs> yeah. But I think maybe because um, the realization of emptiness is quite um, challenging. It's quite a, um, it's an experience to actually have the realization of not just the intellectual understanding of non inherent existence, but having the non conceptual experience of it. Yeah, these very advanced. Um, meditators of that, yeah. Any other, any questions? Must be time for a cup of tea, coffee, something to eat. I think, that, is the shop open? Yes, the shop is open. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's some um, tea and coffee out the um, the back, out in the fresh air and sunshine, and um, and the shops open too if you like to buy any goodies in there as well. And we'll be back next week and we'll continue on with the um, the other chapters. I think the next ones are um, life and death and all that good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed your your session. Pleasure. Thank you.